we light this flame as those to whom God has spoken, with lives touched by word made flesh in Jesus, believing that God's word still sheds its light on the chaos and concerns of human circumstances. A light of love is kindled amidst a world of many voices, each clamouring to be heard and to silence any that are raised in contradiction. But among their narratives of division and distortion, we seek again that song of love which can always be heard by those who choose to listen. We hear again the voices of prophets echo their message of truth in every generation, declaring God's comfort to those who despair and challenge to those who believe this world to be their own. We who believe that God's word still speaks, light this flame to declare our readiness to hear seeking peace through knowing that in the deepest despair echoes of hope can be at their most profound.
And so hello and welcome to this service for the second Sunday, the second week in Advent. This is also the first Sunday in December, confusingly enough, and so this will be a communion service. So if you w want to join in with that later in this act of worship, then please have some bread and something to act as wine, and we will share together to remember the great love of God shown in Jesus Christ. Let's join together and say our opening prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, out of your great love for us, you gave your Son to our world to show us your love in how he lived, in how he died for us, in how he rose again for us. And you keep sending out your love into the world through your Holy Spirit and the words and actions he inspires. As we remember the love that came into the world at Christmas, may it fill our hearts once again, stirring up our love for you once more. And may we, this Advent, this Christmas and always, be messengers of that love that was born in Bethlehem and which still longs to be born in people's lives today. Amen. This is love, says the Bible, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let us praise God for his wonderful love shown in Jesus. How wonderful, how glorious is the love of God. of God, bringing healing, forgiveness, a wonderful love, how wonderful, how glorious is the love of God, bringing healing, forgiveness, a wonderful love, let celebration echo through this land. Reconciliation we bring up to every man. How wonderful, how glorious is the love of God bringing healing, forgiveness, a wonderful love. We proclaim the kingdom of our God is here. Come and join the heavenly anthem. And let's come before our loving Heavenly Father with our prayers. Let us pray. And as we pray, let's remember God's love for us. The love that seeks us and accepts us just as we are.
the love that forgives our sins willingly. The love that gives us Jesus, God's love made flesh. The love that sticks with us, no matter what we've been through or what we are facing. and the love that gives us hope for our world and for those whom we love. Thank you, dear Lord that in your love you hear our prayers. No matter how big or how small they seem to us, thank you that they matter to you. We bring them before you now in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen.
Our first reading is from the Old Testament prophet Malachi. It's read to us by David Suchet. I will send my messenger, who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. And our second reading comes from Luke's Gospel, from Luke chapter 3. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria and Traconitus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. May God bless to us the reading of his word today. So imagine you're in the middle of getting ready for Christmas. You're putting the decorations up, you're writing your cards, even to those people who you said last year you wouldn't write cards to again because they never send cards back to you. You're placing a huge order on Amazon so that you don't have to venture into the Trafford Centre for your presents because who wants to go there at this time of year? You're trying to decide which Christmas CDs or Spotify playlist or whatever to put on, even though they've all got the same songs on, just in a slightly different order. And then, imagine that suddenly someone bursts into your home, tears down the decorations, rips up the cards, cancels the Amazon order, deliberately scratches the CDs and says, Stop! Stop! You, you've got it all wrong! This isn't how to prepare for Christmas! You've got to repent instead. Uh, oh. Or imagine something different. Imagine you and your people are trapped in a foreign land, being held by a despicable dictator. You're hoping for release, for a chance to escape. But the border is heavily guarded, and the way back home is treacherous. But then, then you hear that a messenger's on the way with news good news from home this is it you think this is the news we've been waiting for it's time to get ready to go escape and freedom are in sight except when the messenger reaches you his message is mixed yes you're being rescued in fact special forces are on the way now to try and get you out but they'll only come and bring you out if you commit to changing your life, if you think about all the bad habits and wrong ways you've been living in and commit to try and change them. Oh. John, John the Baptist, comes to people who are longing for freedom. Not that they were exiles in a foreign land any longer, although the memories of that exile and how they got there still lived large in many people's memories despite the centuries that had passed but these were people who were kind of exiles in their own land people who were under roman occupation people who weren't free even in the country they believed god had given them 
These were people who were wanting, desperately longing to hear the message that God would come and set them free. And yes, John says to them, God is coming to set you free. And Luke links John's words and actions with words from the book of Isaiah, picturing him as a herald calling for the way to the exiles to be made ready straight and level and smooth so that God can come and set his people free except there's also a shock in what he says a sting in the tail if you like particularly in what it seems John believes preparing the way for the Lord actually means you see this isn't about preparing and getting ready the first century equivalents of bulldozers and jcbs and getting going with some serious earth moving and it's not about raising up an army to go and chuck the romans out either no for john preparing the way means repenting and not just saying sorry and asking for god's forgiveness although those are important no John wants the people to really truly think about the way that they have been living, living away from the way God called them to live. And he wants them to commit through God's power and God's grace to seek to live in his ways from now on and to truly be God's people, not just in name, but in the whole of their lives. And all this if they take this up will be shown as they are plunged into the river jordan in the act of baptism a sign of their repentance and of their forgiveness and of the new life that they will seek to live because actually for john and for jesus the problem isn't just the romans and their occupation brutal as they were the problem is actually inside the people inside their hearts and inside their lives and inside the ways that they keep turning away from God and that says John has to change because God's rescue is coming Messiah is on his way but if you're not ready John says if you've not prepared properly you won't recognize him you won't be able to accept him and you won't find the freedom that he longs to give you because you won't know what it is now let's be honest this isn't a message that's particularly easy to hear in advent is it i mean repent think and pray about our lives and ask god to help us change them recognize that things are wrong in our lives i mean that's not advent that's lent isn't it lent is the time when we do all that with the ashes on our forehead and giving stuff up and everything else advent's about excitement and hope and light in the darkness and preparing for god's wondrous gift of his son isn't it well yes and i don't want to come across here as a scrooge or a grinch or a grumpy old man shouting at the cloud although i will admit to objecting slightly to being wished a happy christmas in november but my point is this we need to remember whose arrival it is that we're preparing for not just baby jesus in the manger whose sweet harmless presence is so often at the center of our, of our nativity plays and stories we need to remember that he's also jesus the lord the true lord the one whose birth will trouble kings and sideline priests and will bring the word of god to a barren older woman a young virgin and some shepherds randomly in the fields and eventually to an obscure prophet in the middle of the desert the Lord, someone whose birth will mark the beginning of god's project of overturning the powerful and raising up the humble and lowly bringing down kings and rulers and empires and giving power and prestige and places of honor to the meek and the stranger and the lost and yes 
this is the birth of Jesus the Savior and we should rejoice in that Jesus our Savior is born but Jesus came not just to make our lives better much less to make them easier but to save us from what most damages us our own turnings away from God's our own sins our own failings and by the way if you think that this is just angry preacher shouts at congregation then go back and listen to the Malachi passage and note who the prophet specifically says will be cleansed by this mysterious messenger it's the Levites the priests the religious leaders and professionals people like me and perhaps the people who have to do the most thinking and praying and yes repenting are those of us who claim to have been called by God in some way to do what I'm doing now pray for us the question is then what can we do how can we meet this challenge however uncomfortable it may be well we could think about where our presents and our food come from and who prepares and delivers them in what we buy and in how we order it are we helping others or are we participating in ways in which their lives are made harder we could think about how much stuff we have and buy and consume and waste not just at Christmas but all through the year and we could think about how much of a part Jesus truly plays in our Christmas is he there because well it's Christmas and he's supposed to be there or do we truly let him call the shots are we truly beginning to understand what it means to worship this strange unexpected but grace-giving king and again I don't say these things to claim that I've got them sorted and you should do what I do <laughs> I wish in the words of the great theologian uh, Des Lynam, listen I'm with you how could you miss this because this is a chance that is too great for us to miss the chance to find that freedom that the people whom John spoke to longed for and which he told them about perhaps the freedom that we know deep inside of us that we truly need this is the chance to find the Lord whom we seek this is the chance to find something this Christmas that no one and nothing else can give us no matter what the John Lewis adverts tell us so let's put up our decorations let's prepare our food let's put on the Christmas CDs if you absolutely must and let's share the presents and cards and let's have a joy filled Christmas and prepare for that but let's also truly get ready for Christmas let's make room in our homes in our Advent busyness in our church and in our lives for the coming of this baby this king this savior jesus come now long expected jesus born to set thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee israel's strength and consolation above all the earth thou art dear desire of every nation joy of every
Almighty God, before whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we might perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We don't often associate the manger and the cross. They don't seem to belong together. One speaks of hope and light and joy and wonder. The other speaks of darkness and death and violence and suffering. But they absolutely belong together because both the crib and the cross speak ultimately of God's love. The love that caused Jesus to leave behind his power and glory and be born as one of us. The love that caused Jesus to go to the cross, to suffer and die for our sins. And so, with these two signs of love in our minds, we take these other signs of love in our hands. The bread and the wine, the body and blood of Jesus. And through them we follow Jesus' instruction to remember him. Love incarnate, love supreme, love that still flows from him into our lives and into our world. Let's remember through the words of Paul how this meal came to be. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, you have been revealed to us as the light of the world, the source of all hope and joy the source of all love and life. For this we praise and worship you. Now you reveal yourself to us through the bread and wine, signs and symbols of your body broken for us, your blood shed for us, your life given for us and to us. And for this we come to eat and drink together. Please come among us and reveal yourself to us afresh. Join us with you and with each other so that your light may shine among us and so that we can live your new life today, tomorrow and forever. Amen. The Body of Christ, Broken for us. Let's eat together and remember the great love of God in Jesus Christ. the cup of the new covenant sealed through christ's blood through the love of god for us let's drink and be thankful
and let's pray together. Loving God, love has come to us, been born in us, in Jesus Christ, and love has shown its fullest expression to us through his death and resurrection for us. God who is love, let your Loving God, love has been Loving God, love has come to us, been born in us in Jesus Christ, and love has shown its fullest expression to us through his death and resurrection for us. God who is love, let your love fill our lives today so that we can fill our community and our world with it through the love and power of your Spirit. And loving God, we know that you didn't love us just so that we could keep that love to ourselves, but so that we could share it and give that love to those who need to know that they are loved. So in this Advent period, we pray for those who are waiting for love, for those who feel loveless, for those in refugee camps and asylum seeker detention centres, not knowing what the future holds, for those whose lives are marred by abuse or neglect, wondering if anyone truly loves them. For those who feel abandoned by everyone they love because of the trouble they're in and who don't know where to turn. For those for whom Christmas means stress, anxiety and worry. For those who can only look in on other people's celebrations from the outside, those who won't be invited in. And for those who are remembering someone they love, whose absence hurts especially right now. Thank you, Lord, for the wonder of being loved by others and by you. Please show your love to all these people, we pray, so that their lives can be transformed by your love and the healing, forgiveness, hope and life that it brings. And Lord, as we remember them, we remember those whom we have loved and who are now gone to be with you. We remember George Roberts, Phyllis Oliver, Wilf Green, Mary Lawrence, Irene Hallsworth, Benjamin Amos. We remember Arthur Bolton, Nell Chadwick, Stephen Ragg, Gladys Parker, Eric Bailey, Jack Musgrove. We remember Elsie Brooks, Christopher Brown, Emily Moores, Ada Birchall, Mavis Blady, John Birtwistle. And we remember Annie Brown, Eva Gudgeon, Elsie Auden, Dora Kirshner, Vicky Groves, Kathy Scott and Margaret Armstrong. Lord, we remember them as people whom we have loved and lost, but we remember as well that your love cannot be stopped by death. And so that in you, 
their lives continue and that your love is made complete for them and in them. We pray that that hope of your great love will be ours, will sustain us and keep us and help us to follow you this Christmas and always. In Jesus' name, Amen. We close by singing a hymn that isn't really an Advent or a Christmas hymn, but is one that speaks of all that we've been thinking about in this service and in this time of communion. Lord Jesus Christ, you have come to us, living Lord. And let's share the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. 
Amen. Thank you as always for watching or listening to this service. Next week is a special service. It's what we call our memorial service. And it's a time we take every Advent to remember those whom we have loved, who have gone from us. Those whose presence and life we particularly miss at this time of year. If there is someone whom you would like to be specifically mentioned in this service, then please contact us and we can make sure that happens. You can leave a comment if you're watching this online. You can email us. I'll make sure the email address is in the description. Or you could write us a letter or phone us, whatever. Please let us know if there is someone whom you would like to mention. It would be useful to have those by next Thursday, if possible. And if you want to join us next Sunday in the building, then we will be having that service there as well. Until then, may God bless you and take care of you this week and always. Bye-bye.